September 1599, Sir Thomas Smythe, the founder of the East India Company, gathered about a hundred of the richer English merchants and pressed them to commit individual subscriptions of about a hundred to three thousand pounds, a considerable amount of money at the time, to start a new company that would make voyage to India to trade. He wanted to petition the last of the Tudor, now aging Elizabeth I, to grant them a royal charter. Smythe managed to raise over three million pounds in all. England at the start of the 16th century was a relatively impoverished agricultural country. It had wasted almost a half century at war over religion. They began to look into new markets with a rapine intent and piratical fervor. The notorious privateer and slave trader Sir Francis Drake in 1560s raided so many Spanish ships and made considerable profits from it. He set sail in 1577 from profits he made on a global voyage in hope of gold and spices. But he returned home shortly after plundering a Portuguese ship more than 10 million pounds. These scavenging trips were crown licensed and state sanctioned. The legal pirate Sir Walter Raleigh, Drake's rival and founder of Roanoke Island, was given a royal charter to explore and colonize any land he might find by Elizabeth I in 1584. Compared to many of their European counterparts, the English were ranked amateurs at sea travel. They returned with little more than wonderful tales of their efforts in looting ships, and with neither crews nor cargoes intact. Ralph Fitch was sent to the east to buy spice for Smythe, but he was arrested shortly after by the Portuguese. He was sent to the Indian state of Goa in chains where he would be dropped from a height attached to a rope. He was, however, helped to escape. His return to London three years later made him a celebrity of some sort, mentioned by Shakespeare in Macbeth. He arrived home with no pepper. The next attempt to break into the spice trade was the voyage of Sir James Lancaster in 1591. He was the first English to attempt to reach the east via the Cape in Africa. On the way he was struck by a cyclone, stuck in the doldrums, ravaged by scurvy, lost three ships out of four, and seen almost all his crew members speared to death by native islanders. It was also a devastating financial failure. The more successful Portuguese and Spanish had been making profits for well over a century. Spain was the wealthiest country of Europe at the time, and Portugal controlled the seas and the spice of the east. The Dutch had also successfully returned from Indonesia with 800 tons of pepper, 200 tons of cloves, and great quantities of cinnamon and nutmeg. They made over 400% profit. England was however going nowhere. The final straw was when the Dutch sent a delegation to London to try to buy up English shipping for further voyages eastwards. The nerve! This was too much for Elizabethan pride. The subscribers to the voyage feared, with reason, that the Dutch had ruined their existing investment in the spice trade. This was the reason Smythe and his associate had decided to found a company and open it to any new subscriber who would contribute. The East India Company was from the very first conceived as a joint stock corporation, open to all investors. Costs were astronomically high. The commodities they wished to buy were extremely expensive and they were carried in huge, costly ships that needed to be manned by large crews and protected by artillery masters and professional musket men. Even if everything went according to plan, there would be no return on investment for several years. On the 31st of December in 1600, a group of 218 men received their royal charter. Elizabeth's like, I judge your promises and offers as impossible and vain and worthy of rejection. Go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. No, I'm kidding. Go have your fun on the sea, man. You should see thy faces. The charter bestowed upon them great powers like freedom from all customs duties for their first six voyages. A monopoly for 15 years in trade and traffic on near two-thirds part of the trading world and semi-sovereign privileges to rule territories and raise armies. It allowed East India Company officials to claim jurisdiction over all English subjects in Asia. 
mint money, raise fortification, make laws, wage wars, conduct policies, hold courts, issue punishment, imprison subjects, and plant English settlements. Shipping essentials like masts, anchors, and riggings had been prepared. Armaments like muskets, pikes, and barrels of powder had been purchased. Beer, pork, oatmeal, rice, dried fish, etc. were well supplied and collected. In February of 1601, the voyage almost got off to a bad start. For two months, the ships stood in the English Channel due to wind. By September, they had rounded the Cape in Africa. They then headed to Mauritius, where they found a series of carvings on a rock. Five Dutch ships had recorded their visit only five months earlier. Finally, it was 1602 that Lancaster's fleet made it to the Indonesian province of Aceh and began to negotiate for spice with the Sultan. Lancaster was authorized to indulge in piracy against the Spanish or Portuguese ships. He did not hesitate. A year later in 1603, Lancaster finally arrived in England. He had brought back all four of his vessels, intact and fully loaded, and no less than 900 tons of pepper, cinnamon, and cloves. The voyage made an impressive 300% profit. Fifteen more East India Company expeditions over the next 15 years set out. This was still so small compared to what the Dutch were already bringing in. The different Dutch East India Companies had already amalgamated to the VOC, Verenigde de Oostindisch Company. VOC had raised almost 10 times the capital of the English East India Company and immediately in a position to offer investors a 3,600% dividend. After several considerations, the East India Company directors decided they had little option but to leave the lucrative Spice Islands and their aromatic spice trade to the Dutch and focus instead on less competitive but potentially more promising sectors of the trade of Asia. Fine cotton textiles, indigo, and chintzes. The sources of all three of these luxuries was, of course, India. On the 28th of August in 1608, Captain William Hawkins landed on the shores of Shuret and became the first commander of an East India Company ship to set foot on Indian soil. India at the time had a population of 150 million, a fifth of the world's total. India was producing a quarter of global manufacturing. In comparison, England had just 5% of India's population and was producing just 3% of the world's manufactured goods. The Mughal emperor had an income of around 10 billion pounds, by far the richest monarch of the world. The Mughal capitals were the megacities of their days. They were second to none in either Asia or Europe. The earliest 17th century Europeans were used to the easy victories over the other peoples of the world. But as Captain Hawkins soon realized, there was no question of any European nation attempting to wage war against the great Mughals, because the Mughals kept a staggering four million men under arms. Any sort of unauthorized fortifications were quelled without much effort. With this in mind, the company realized that if it was to trade successfully with the Mughals, it would need both partners and permissions from the emperor himself. Captain Hawkins took a year to reach Agra, but Emperor Jahangir soon lost interest and sent him off. This time, a more impressive mission was called for, sending a royal envoy. Sir Thomas Rowe arrived in Ajmer with English Mastiffs and Irish Greyhounds. Jahangir was an enormously sensitive, curious, and intelligent man, observant of the world around him and a keen collector of its curiosities. The emperor could barely conceal his boredom at Rowe as he paid his respect to the emperor. Roe was vexed to discover that the Mughals regarded relations with the English as very low priority. When he returned to England after three years at court, he had obtained permission from Jahangir to build a factory at Suret. On his return to London, Roe made it clear to the company directors that force of arms was not an option when dealing with the Mughal Empire. And yes, they took his advice. Early East India Company officials prided themselves on negotiating commercial privileges rather than resorting to attacking strategies. Jahangir, however, made a deliberate point of not conceding any major trading privileges. 
Rose's mission was the beginning of a Mughal company relationship that would develop into something approaching the partnership and the East India Company gradually was drawn into the Mughal nexus. Over the next 200 years, it would slowly learn to operate skillfully within the Mughal system. While Ro was charming Jahangir, Captain Hippon was dispatched at the Coromandel coast and established a second factory in Masuliputnam, the port of the Mughal's great Dakani rivals, where the finest jewels, diamonds, and chintz could be bought in India. This trade in jewels, pepper, textiles, and saltpetre soon resulted in even better returns than the Dutch trade in aromatic spices. By the 1630s, the East India Company was importing 1 million pounds of pepper from India. 30 years later, they were importing a quarter million of pieces of cloth. Losses were still heavy. Between 1601 and 1640, the company set a total of 168 ships. Only 104 arrived back. The company's balance sheets grew increasingly profitable. In 1613, the subscription for the first joint stock raised nearly 44 million pounds. Four years later, the subscription to the second joint stock pulled a massive 170 million pounds. It had become colossally profitable. It was not until 1626 that the East India Company founded its first fortified Indian base at Armagon on the central Coromandel coast. It was abandoned. Two years later, they tried again for the right to build a new East India Company fort at Madras Putnam. This time the settlement, soon known as Madras, flourished and had grown to be the first English colonial town in India. By 1670s, the town was minting gold coins. The second big English settlement in India came into the hands of the company via the crown, which in turn received it as a wedding gift from the Portuguese monarchy. It was the island of Bombay. When Sir Abraham Shipman first arrived with 450 men to claim Bombay for the English in September 1662, his mission was blocked at gunpoint. It was after three years before the British were finally able to take over with only about a hundred men left. It became the best natural harbor, but the rowdy English were becoming less and less welcome there. The British were soon being reviled in the Charette streets with the name of Benchur, meaning sister. Meanwhile, in London, the company directors were beginning to realize for the first time how powerful they were. In 1693, less than a century after its foundation, the company was discovered to be using its own share for buying the favors of parliamentarians. As it shelled out annually £1,200 a year to prominent MPs and ministers, the parliamentary investigation into this, the world's first corporate lobbying scandal, found the East India Company guilty of bribery and insider trading and led to the impeachment of the Lord President of the Council and the imprisonment of the company's governor. Only once during the 17th century did the company try to use its strength against the Mughals, and then with catastrophic consequences. Ignorant of the scale of Mughal power, the newly appointed director Josiah Child made a childish decision to react with force and attempt to teach the Mughals a lesson. So, in 1686, a considerable fleet sailed from London to Bengal with 19 warships, 200 cannons, and 600 soldiers. But Child could not have chosen a worse moment to pick a fight with the emperor of the richest kingdom on earth. The Mughals had just completed their conquest of the great two Deccan Sultanates of Bijapur and Golconda and seemed to have driven the Marathas back to the hills from whence they came. They emerged as unrivaled power. The Mughal war machine swept away the English landing parties as easily as if it were swatting flies. Almost all East India Company factories were seized and plundered, and the English had been expelled completely from Bengal. When Aurangzeb heard that the East India Company had repented of their irregular proceedings and submitted to Mughal authority, the emperor left them to lick their wounds for a while, and then in 1690 graciously agreed to forgive them. After this fiasco, Jab Charnik decided to found a new British base in Bengal in 1690. Bengal was the finest, most fruitful country in the world, and it was one of the richest, most populous, and best cultivated countries. It was the wealthiest region of the Mughal Empire, the one place where fortunes could most easily be made. The company existed to make money, 
and Bengal, they soon realized, was the best place to do it. It was the death of Aurangzeb in 1707 that changed everything for the company. And we're going to talk about it in another video. Thanks to everyone for watching this video. If you liked it, please click the like button, hit the subscribe button, and ring the bell, and we can get you more videos just like it.